Hello everyone, welcome. And the next speaker is Tim Gallo uh, with five laws of li librarianship in your Intel operation. And um, but first we'll like to say thanks to our sponsors. And they are our gold level level sponsors are St. Mary's University, USAA, Trend Micro, Digital Defense, and Sands Institute. So enjoy. So we're getting really intimate here, all three of you that are here, or four that are here to listen to me. Um, okay. Yeah, I know. I know. It, 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 they put me up against something. And to be quite frank, when you hear the sound of the topic, it sounds really boring. But to be, to be it, what I find it is, it's going to be pretty interesting if you have been in security and have moved into Intel, or if you've been in Intel and need apologies from people that are in security. Because there is a big difference between what we try to do, and ultimately it comes down to what I learned from a friend of mine uh, a few years ago about librarianship, ultimately. So, a couple things first off the bat, I swear, I apologize in advance, I don't see any minors in the room, so I'm just letting you know right now, I was raised by sailors, my mom's uh, got a mouth like you wouldn't fucking believe. I learned that from her, so just be forewarned, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be that person. I also put this in uh, in every one of my talks. I've done I've done quite a few talks uh, around uh, around and uh, about two years ago. I put this in. Um, it's important, I think, uh, for those of us in the infosec community to recognize that we actually have a higher rate of suicide in our community than in other uh, than other professional communities. There's only a few that have a higher rate than we do. One of them is dentistry. I don't understand, except that must be really, really dull sticking your mouth, uh, your hands in people's mouths all day. But we do have a, a high suicide rate, and particularly amongst uh, uh, former, uh, against uh, amongst veterans that have joined cybersecurity as well. So just keep that in mind. Think about what you've got to deal with um, and what those what people may be dealing with. If you see the signs of somebody that's that's potentially suicidal, please talk to them. Bring it up. Use the resources that are available. It's important because we don't want to lose great minds like we've lost over the last five years. Don't want to continue to lose those minds. So now, let's go ahead and get started. Brief agenda. A little bit about me. Where do we, how do we get to uh, cyber threat intelligence as a discipline? Why this is important, I think, is gonna, is gonna be one of the key components of this. Um, what are the laws of library science that showed up in the, in the title? Um, why, what do they mean? How does a threat intelligence operation work? And where do the laws of library science and threat intelligence converge? To be quite frank, many of us don't think about intelligence as librarianship and vice versa. We tend to think of it as an offset of uh, security operations. And uh, I think that is actually a mistake. Um, different tools that we can use to make this more effective, who should be engaged ultimately in building your operation. Uh, other sources of analysis, stuff like that. So before I get into who am I, there's five of you in the room. How many of you are actually threat intel people? One? OK. Did you start off as an intel person? Or did you start off as a security person? Wow. OK. That happens more and more frequently, particularly when I'm in areas that have uh, large uh, Air Force bases uh, that have a significant population of intel operations, um, or naval bases that have that, or other forts, whatever. Um, but to be quite honest, most of uh, most people, kind of like myself, started in security in some way, ended up in intel operations. Um, and I like to apologize in advance for the things that we have brought to your discipline that have kind of fucked it up. Um, I've, uh, I, I spent a lot of time learning um, at the, the feet of Intel operators after spending about 10 years in security, um, trying to figure out what it is that I was doing wrong and why I was thinking incorrectly, and ultimately how it came out. So I like to say that the person that you see on all my LinkedIn and Twitter and all that is this, this suave, debonair, black and white, kind of hackery but not hackery looking dude. This is the person who I like to think of myself as, somebody who goes out to the desert, rides motorcycles, breaks shit, burns shit, causes all sorts of problems. This is the person that I really probably am. It's the idiot who on his 40th birthday decided that he wanted to have a toga party because he never got to have one when he was in college and uh, got really, really hammered shortly after that picture was taken. Um, <laughs> 
So that's probably more like who I am. But what this means is, ultimately, let me give you a little bit of background. I started in InfoSec uh, in the in the 90s. In 2002, I was pulled into a room uh, and asked to perform some uh, some sort of network magic for some folks and uh, provide them with some uh, attribution. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. Then they sucked me in. Um, at that point, I started to get engaged with them more frequently, developed, uh, moved out of network security and information security into uh, sort of intelligence uh, through sort of telemetrics and network uh, network intelligence, and then eventually started to, to meet some of the, the sort of intelligence operators and get an idea of what overall intelligence programs look like and how you should how we how we from security interact with them very differently than than the way they want to be interacted with. So. I think from a security perspective, and this is where I'm putting this out, there's typically two paths to get there. Um, people either come from sort of a compliance and patch management role, where they've been doing things like vulnerability intelligence analysis, working with uh, infrastructure management, and then ultimately delivering sort of intel into the what is in my stuff, and how do I, what do I need to worry about, right? It's verbose, it usually has some metrics, but to be quite frank, it's it's things keeping things up to date, right? I know a vuln is out there. I need to patch the vulnerability. It's it feels kind of rote, but it's actually very important because if we don't do this, uh, then we are screwed, right? We're just leaving wide open holes for every attacker to just sort of walk their way through. The other way people often get to, and this is kind of how I ended up there, uh, into uh, cyber threat intelligence is from security operations. Maybe from incident response, but typically from sort of somewhere in the cyber defense center, right? Usually it's supporting the IR process, you're looking in your SIM, you're doing like IOC hunting, you, you're usually focused on that lower end of the pyramid of pain. The, the four of you in the room, if I, does everyone in the room know what the pyramid of pain is? Excellent, they're nodding heads, just for the recording. Um, the key components to this typically are that it's minimalist, right? We're focused on automation. We want speed, we want IOCs, we want to get this in front of the person who makes a decision kind of quickly, right? Oftentimes, the initial focus from a security perspective on this, on this portion of Intel is actually about speed to detection and then, you know, you know, quickly remediating. Um, it's, it, it, unless you're part of the IR process, it's not really in the investigatorial components. So I like to say compliance is about knowing, then uh, enhancing, and then or enforcing, and then understanding. Right. So it's about knowing where your vulnerabilities are, knowing which patches to apply, uh, ultimately enforcing specific rules, and you leveraging that rules enforcement to make sure the patches are applied. So something can't get on the network if it doesn't have the appropriate patch. Making sure that if it does, then it's got access to the appropriate credentials, and making certain that everything actually runs. It's specifically about protecting, protecting against exploits. So the understand component is really where the vulnerability portion of this actually expands, right? It's no longer just knowing, it's not just running Tenable or Nessus and vulns, you know, vuln scanning and finding out what's there. It's looking at everything, right? Enforcement. It leads to understanding. Ultimately, you want to look at everything from when you've deployed an, an application all the way through when those applications retire. Because applications almost never retire. At least in my 20 years, I, it's really hard to find somebody who has actually finally killed an application. I think I can remember killing Lotus Notes. But a lot of times, applications still find some way to live on in some arcane process. And so we want to make certain that we understand what the service's criticalities are and what our enforceability is amongst users in that, right? So if we're looking at threat in, at CTI sort of from that vulnerability perspective, ultimately we've learned to look at it of uh, if we're a mature organization, we've developed a, uh, you know, sort of a gold, silver, platinum, uh, bronze, whatever you want to call it, matrix of, of, uh, I guess the, the, the best way is service criticality, right? What is it, how does it affect the business? Once you've done that, you, you know the exploitability of specific vulnerabilities and the, the risks associated with that 
with that service being exploited, right? You've got to engage with the line of business. I apologize, I tend to walk. Um, uh, you, you understand that the way that engages with that service engages with the line of business and ultimately what the, the risks are then to the business because you've got, you, you've got to live in that space, right? Typically, you prioritize based upon execution of proof of concept, right? Uh, if you're just doing it based upon CVSS score, you're doing it wrong. Period. The end. Um, I, you've got to know what exploits are out there, what are being actively, you know, which ones are actively being exploited and weaponized and which particular pieces of malware that are targeting you as an institution, understanding who you are institutionally, organizationally, and then determining which of the applications are the most important, right? And I'm gonna, there's a, there's gonna be a theme to this eventually. You're, you'll pick up on it. Um, if you came from Cyber Defense Center, you've been in SecOps, uh, typically you're, it's more of the C respond hunt. As you mature in that space, right? The first focus for any, you know, anybody who's developing a security operations program with threat intelligence and, and you talk to the SOC manager and the first thing they want to do is they want to see those IOCs. They want to know when I've communicated out with that C2 channel, right? That's a big deal. Well, yeah. They want to know when files that don't, that shouldn't exist do. When certain things have been dropped, when something bad has gone on. They want to know when something is executing that shouldn't be executing. Again. This is all about just like reactionary work. It's ultimately level one SOC operations, just more than, more than just correlation, right? It's actually starting to get a little bit, you know, a little bit more interesting and actually and interested in what's actually going on, not just looking for alerts off your technology. The next step as you mature organizationally is in this response phase, right? It's like, oh, I need to find everybody who talked to this bad computer. Well, I need some tools that help me do that or I need some capabilities there. And, and the threat intelligence helps them, under, will help you understand, okay, like, I know that it, this was the C2 channel that was communicated to by this laptop, that that C2 channel is associated with this adversary group and this adversary group tends to then map out internally using PowerShell. Well, if I go back to the rest of my logs, I identify PowerShell uh, commands that are run on that laptop and see who else it communicated, out, uh, who else this device communicated with internally. It's part of that response process, right? Um, also, obviously, using it to lock down people, right? Using Intel to lock down somebody who's shown up in alert. Oh, crap. Uh, this device has, uh, this device has, uh, got three pieces of malware on it that just, that just hit, but we don't know how long it's been there because those files have existed for at least seven days. Want to lock it down, knock it off, slide it to the side. And then eventually looking at sort of spread, right? Using these IOCs, the pattern matching, it's kind of that, like, second generation investigation, right? I'm, I'm not doing a true evidence collection, uh, or, you know, uh, compromise uh, of the evaluation of the compromise of the network as of yet. It's more about just getting things together. When you get to the sort of the third tier from a uh, maturity perspective in Cyber Defense Center, typically you're looking for IOCs without evidence compromise. You develop tools, you've got things in place that allow you to take a, you know expansive TTP and look within the environment for those things. Enterprise searches for uh, combinations of specific mutexes, DLLs, and uh, file hashes, or uh, communication patterns that uh, make the, the, you know, TCP headers look like they're oversized because, uh, you know, from certain devices, combine that with uh, a, a change in a registry key on a Windows laptop. That's going to identify that maybe somebody's doing some TCP packet stuffing, they've changed the, the DLL associated with the network, and they're actually exfiltrating data in TCP headers, right? These are all things that you should be looking for. So it's it's all that like hunting around for dead bodies ultimately, right? It, it's no longer just waiting for somebody to come to you. It's you know who you are and you know what you have. So you start hunting for the hunters, right? We're now at this point sort of like thinking about them, the adversary that's targeting us, 
what should we be looking for then that they like to use? Uh, I, I believe it was, uh, Dave that opened up in, uh, uh, track one this morning talked about and showed, you know, the experience of various TTP for various APT groups or monkey, panda, blah, blah, blah. Pick your favorite nomenclature. There's a great Rosetta Stone that, that, uh, Marfor Cyber has put out. It's on Google Docs. It's actually really fantastic to use. Um, but there's, uh, you know, you know who they're targeting. You know what their TTP looks like. Search for that. Because in all likelihood, you might not have any alerts on it. Because, you know, if they're the good, if they're the, the really good ones that are at you, you're, you're probably screwed. I mean, you know, so you've got to go start finding that TTP yourself because your technology is probably not going to alert on it. And if it is, then you have done a fantastic job of tuning your technology. And I'm proud of you. So, this is one of the things that I like to apologize for. Security versus cyber threat intelligence or threat intelligence in general. Typically from security, you know, we, we think of it this way, right? There's two job functions. CTI, I want to know. I need to understand, right? So I'm going to spend time researching, reviewing, watching through the logs and not tipping off to the adversary that I have, uh, that I found them, right? Because I need to know where they're going and what they're doing so I can better protect myself later. Not only can I contain them now, maybe building out virtual systems to slide them into and find ways to, to ultimately contain them, but then identify what it is that they're doing long term, performing a long term investigation ostensibly, right? I'm doing an Intel op against an adversary that's live inside my network and CTI, we want to do that because we need to know more about what's happening. Whereas security, it's like, I got to stop it, right? It's the difference between a traffic cop and a detective, ultimately. Typically, as security, you want to stop the bad man from hurting you. You want to stop the bleeding, contain the threat, kind of call it a day. Um, you're not necessarily working about working on learning. And this is finally starting to go away. It used to be, like I say, two years ago, this was still like a huge, a huge differentiator between the two. Over the past two years, those four letters, Defer really have kind of started to bring everybody together, right? And this is like Intel needs to know where they should start looking for things. Security needs to to start actioning on what uh, what Intel has provided with them. Security has to instrument so Intel can identify, and it actually kind of comes together under this model uh, that I think ultimately is is changed and is continuing to change. Now, you'll look at organizational maturity over the next five years, and I'll say we'll probably reach about 30% of the organizations across uh, uh, globally. Uh, we'll probably get to the point where we where this becomes a regular methodology. Uh, I would say in the last two years, it has gone from half a percent to about 7% of the organizations based that I've worked with. So I spend a lot of time traveling uh, uh, the globe, and yeah, seven out of ten, uh, seven out of a hundred now at least have some sort of connection here. Many of them are starting to actually jump on the CTI train, but they're still focused primarily on indicators. They're still focused on that s SOC operations mission, and that's good. It's a step, but we want to think about this in a bigger way. Yeah. So are you going to define coming up, like what your view of a intelligence operation should be? I am. So I'm going to sidetrack for a second, but I'm going to get there. So the whole point of this was about the five laws of librarianship, where they kind of came from. So this is an interesting thing. Uh, uh, I was in Virginia two years ago talking about threat intelligence operations at a small, uh, at a conference there, and I was speaking with somebody who mentioned this sort of five laws of library science. Um, her name is Infosec, Infosec Sherpa, follow her on Twitter. Um, but I started doing research on this, and this kind of became an actual mantra for me as I realized that these are kind of the ideas that we need to build our threat intelligence operation around. So. Historically speaking, S.R. Uh, Ragnathan in 1931 came up with these ideas. Book 
books are for use. Every person has his or her book. Every book has its reader. The save, we want to save the time of the reader, and the library is a growing organism. From a CTI perspective, all of these apply, and we're going to dig in a little deeper. So this gentleman, you know, he started as a mathematician, uh, worked in uh, Madra, uh, Madras, Chennai, uh, if you've never been, it's actually a beautiful, uh, there's beautiful temples. It's a great place to go. Uh, in 23, he, in 1923, he was put in charge of the library. And you put a mathematician in charge of a library and things get a little weird. So this is where the idea started, uh, started to come out of was like, he didn't actually want the job, but he was kind of not given much of a choice. Um, and as he started to get into it, this became sort of the mantra. So, law number one, books are for use. So, this is really the basis for all of library science, if you think about it. Books are often chained, you know, in, in uh, the olden days, books were chained in the library to prevent their removal, right? Which meant people couldn't use them. They didn't get access to them. They, uh, it was, librarians were pr primarily focused on preservation. And that's not what good, you know, what good librarianship is about. If we think about it, we want people to use these books. We want them to take them out. We want to put them back. Same thing goes with an Intel operation, right? Books, in this case, are intelligence reports. Intelligence reports are meant to be used by people within the security operations team, right? By people within the DFER organization, by people within vulnerability management. We have to create intelligence reports that are usable. If we don't, then we're not doing our job as Intel operators, as Intel analysts, and ultimately as stewards of our organization. So number two, every person has a his or her book. So thinking about this, right, it's, your idea is to serve a wide collection of patrons. Right, so from a librarian's perspective, they've got a whole list of people that they want to serve in their community. Well, ultimately, when we think about as information, uh, uh, sorry, as threat intelligence uh, operators within an organization, our community is our organization. So we have to figure out what it is that they need from us. So every person has a specific need, and there's a report that is designed, or a combination of reports that ultimately are designed for those readers to make sure that they can make effective business decisions. Keeping the company secure. Third one, every book its reader. This is literally just the reverse, right? So they have a place in the library even if there's a smaller demographic, even if this is only meant for the M&A team. Right? Even if I'm only building, you know, this specific subset of my components for the mergers and acquisitions portion of my organization, there is still a niche and a need there. And I ultimately have to meet those requirements because if I'm not meeting their requirements, they're going to go elsewhere. So again, it's about knowing who we are organizationally and making certain that we're meeting the needs independently. So thinking about it from this perspective, every, again, no matter how narrow it is, we have to make sure that we're creating reports that meet, that, 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 that are usable. Save the time of the reader. This is important because, uh, one of the things that I learned, uh, early on in, uh, in my transition was writing giant 20 page reports. Everybody hated you. You got, they got ignored and then you go, and then ultimately I went way too far the other way and just started putting everything in machine readable JSON or XML and, and again, <laughs> nobody paid attention to it. So ultimately it's coming down to building a model that allows for, for you to save the reader's time. Bottom line up front, the bluff model, it works. It's very straightforward. It's, you know, a very short, uh, uh, summary that's going to be able to get immediately to the action, work your way down to the technical details for the folks that are going to read the report that need the technical details or need the automation scripts and building the report in such a way that matches the organization's needs. If you don't have a technical operation, say you've outsourced your entire uh, security cyber defense center operations to an MSP, then you probably don't need those technical details unless you've got one or two hunters in the environment. You just need sort of the strategic stuff. Lastly, the library is a growing organism. 
So this is one that I think is uh, often, uh, often overlooked as well. Reports aren't static. They have revision numbers, right? Like just my slide deck here said draft four, right? And I've gone through four different versions of this. Actually, I've probably gone through about 16 different versions of this before putting it up today. Um, on average, every report has a life cycle. That life cycle has a terminus point, but that terminus point can be extended as you change uh, and as you apply new intelligence to that report, or you create an association, right? So understanding that I'm either growing it wider or I'm growing it deeper, but making certain that everybody knows if I'm growing a report deeper, right? So there's a continuous level of communication between the Intel operators and the consumers of the intelligence. Because this ultimately is not a write it and forget it and write it and forget it and write it and forget it mentality, it changes the way we have to interact. So, taking those five laws, building out a threat intelligence operation, like this is sort of basics, right? So I think about it, yep. I definitely want to see this, but can you, can you say just for a minute why you would build a threat intelligence like what, 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 what drives the organization to build those? Sure. So, Ultimately, organizations need to get into the threat, are getting into the threat intelligence business because they're looking at it from the perspective of how am I investing my security dollars? In many cases, they're spending lots and lots of money on tools and they're still getting owned up. Right? Like, how many breaches happened in the last three months? Yeah. Uh, I, it's just the way it is. And that's, you know, there's, uh, there's companies whose entire business model revolves, uh, revolve around incident response and responding to breaches. Many of them are big consultancies and that's what they do. So ultimately, threat intelligence is, is, is to help guide you down the path of not just built, buying a bunch of tools and hoping that this next tool is going to be the one that's going to prevent them from happening. It's about understanding your, yourself organizationally, yourself technically, and being able to get predictive and preventive in your security controls. So the reason you want to get into this threat intel operations game is because I'm no longer just going to hope that I can, you know, build a better fence and keep the bad guys out. It's, that I can at least understand who's gonna come at me. And if I know who's gonna come at me, I know what tools I should look for. So they're gonna try to get in. They're probably gonna get in. But I know what I should be looking for once they do. And, and admitting that we're not perfect. I've been a blue teamer most of my life. I did a small stint on the other side. And yeah, uh, I can tell. So, okay. How often does red team win? Every fucking time, right? I mean, come on. Red team always wins. That's why everybody wants to be on the red team, and that's why it's so fucking cool. Again, I apologize about my language. I'm sorry. Um, but ultimately, red team always wins. We have to be right all the time on the blue team side of things. And so we've got to get really invested in learning about what it is that they're trying to do, how they're going to attack us, and, and ways that we can make ourselves better because we do have to be right every time. They only got to be right once. And that sucks, but it's the truth. So when we get into this, right, thinking about it from a maturity perspective, right, starting off with just your basic organizational threat profile. Do you know who you are as a company? What do you do, right? What, what, what does the business make? You know, I, I, I worked for an elevator company at one point in my career. We made elevators and escalators. But you know ultimately what we really were? We were a construction company that had a huge software development house. We wrote a ton of software. Because all of that stuff runs on software. Now, 50 years ago, it all ran on relays and switches, and it was super cool, and I actually... One of the first things I did when I got to work in there was I got to build one from scratch because that's part of the onboarding. It was like you build a little mini elevator and it was super neat. It was all sort of old school resistors and stuff and it was super fun. But ultimately, knowing what you are, what you build, and what the, in the organizational environment is like. Are we risk averse? Company wise? Are we, are we bleeding edge? Do we spend all of our money trying to be first to market? And then understanding the, the vulnerabilities and the exposure you have to these vulnerabilities is also important. 
The next step, stakeholder analysis. Usually, when we first start building our Cyber Threat Intel program, the stakeholder is probably only vulnerability, patch management, infrastructure, and SecOps. But if you're doing it right, you start to identify other, other, mem other portions of the organization. This is where, as a Threat Intel person, You've got to not be the, the nerd sitting in the basement. I fucking hated being that person. But you gotta not be that person. You gotta be outgoing. You gotta go to those lines of business. You gotta talk to everybody and get an understanding what their appetite for risk is. Go to the engineering team. This is how I found out that, you know, we were primarily a software development house. I started hanging out with the engineers, uh, at lunch. And I was like, what do you mean you're not just building this stuff? You, it, and then I come to find out they have, you know, that we had, uh, 300 softies in 1996 for a company that made elevators. It was kind of crazy. Um, but then I started to, you know, start to identify, well, that's, that's the biggest threat. That's ultimately where the risk is, right? Because that was all trade secret. None of it was patented. Everything that was patented was all the hardware stuff. Because somebody can just buy one, you know, can just go look at it. The software was all trade secret. So suddenly now I understand, you know, some of my stakeholders. Building out consumption use cases. This is the other piece. Again, SOC, typically they just want it shoved in through their tip, their threat intelligence platform, or right into Splunk or Elk Stack or, you know, whatever it is that you're using as sort of the, the SOC uh, to do the day-to-day -day look at the things. Um, but there are other consumption use cases, right? As you elevate yourself maturity-wise, ostensibly, if you're doing it right, you're going to be providing quarterly uh, reports to the board. As you mature yourself from a threat intel perspective, and, be, and the reason you're going to be doing that is because you're providing them with an idea of what the risks that they need to look at for the next three months, the next 92 days, are to the organization, and things that you suspect that they should be taking into account as they're making business decisions associated with the with the company. Um, but you've got to understand what their appetite is, right? At first, again, SOC guys want as much as quick as possible, but ultimately you're going to probably start off with these every six months to, you know, somebody in network security that you're going to be reporting to. Once you've made the, the identification of who the consumers are, what the roles are, and what the app, what their appetite is, that's when you get into PIR development. So you're building out your intelligence requirements. This is actually important because I need to know what are my intelligence criteria? What is the categorization that I'm using? What is the intent and expected actions on said intelligence? Um, what kind of products does each of the various groups want? And ultimately, what are the collective sources and methods that I'm going to use to be able to generate my intel from, uh, you know, and put it into the library ultimately, right? Because again, thinking about it from that perspective, we're, we are no longer just working as technical operators. Our goal is to build this library for, uh, for our organization. We start to build practices. And this is where that librarianship really comes into play. Lifecycle management for threat intel. How long is something val how long is an intel report valid for? If I'm updating it, what am I doing to change it? Well, what are the standards? What's, what's my peer review process? Right? If it's just me as an intel analyst and I'm the only one for the organization, then I don't have a lot of peer review process, right? I've, I'm, I'm trying to get it, you know, just trying to get to the point where this is important, but I gotta find some way to at least get it through grammar. Oftentimes, some of your favorite folks to work with in this are legal and marketing because those people love to screw with your handwriting. They like, they like to look at it and be like, that makes no sense or you can't legally say that. Well, that's good because it's a starting point from a peer review perspective. It's at least getting you to the point where you're going to be able to produce reporting that meets their, you know, sort of their understanding. So again, Getting to know people outside of the uh, the CISO's sort of domain, the, gl the global security office, whatever you want to call it, is important in these cases. What are the supporting technologies? So as you're building this out, 
Uh, you're moving into building out threat intelligence platforms and in using those threat intel platforms to integrate into day-to-day -day operations, tier, uh, into tier one, tier two, tier three SOC operations. What's your content management system? Building analytic tool sets, right? So I need to build out a, um, uh, an analyst workbench that's going to allow me the, afford me the ability to start doing node and edge analysis, right? These are those next steps as I get more and more mature. Ultimately, full, fulfilling into a capabilities matrix that allows me to basically build you know, repeatable communications, uh, create a, you know, an internal communications platform that allows me to, to reach out to everybody inside the, or inside the company, uh, key off here in strategic and operational decision support. So this is another, you'll know that you've made it when they start asking you, hey, we're looking at buying this company or expanding our operations into Costa Rica or into, uh, Chile. Can you help us understand what the threats are? How's that going to change us organizationally? Which new adversary is going to be targeting us? And what are the toolkits that we could expect them to use against us because of this change? It's an interesting question. It's, it's not properly formed, but that's the way that question is going to come at you. And then it's about the idea of taking that improperly formed question, understanding the intent of the question, and being able to provide them with the appropriate response that allows them to make a solid business decision. Because they're going to ask a lot of questions and they're going to not make sense as you start to build out what it is intelligence means and the types of questions, the types of RFIs you're going to intake. So I, I went through them sort of uh, elsewhere, but realistically, this is the convergence points, right? Intelligence reports are written for a purpose, not just because they're cool, man. Um, Every person has his or her book. The requirements should be built around each member's use case, right? So build the SOCs, get the SOCs use cases, get the executive team's use cases, get infrastructure's use cases. Build those requirements. Every book gets reader. Each report should have, at the very least, one of the PIRs in mind, at the very least. And if you can cover as many PIRs and SIRs inside a report, great. You're doing it. You should cover as many as possible that still marry ultimately to the goal of, uh, of the report itself. Write in a way that meets the needs of the reader. Make sure that the report, that they're able to look at it in 30 seconds and determine if this is something that they need or not. It should be as simple as glancing at the first three lines, no, I need it or I don't need it, and move on. Because if they have to read two pages to determine that, there was, that they don't need it, you've wasted their time, and then the next time they're not going to look because we're always wrong until we're right. And then again, actors, TTP, adversary, everybody changes. We need to understand that our library of reports is going to constantly change as well. And because the bad guys are changing, we have to change. So we have to make sure we're serializing our reports, that we're doing the right things to identify within the library itself, what is the most recent version of this report and how does it apply to us today? So I go back, so I'm flipping back to what is the actual cycle for generation of intelligence, right? So if we look at it from a capabilities perspective, that was kind of what we think about the operation, but this is actually building out an Intel report, right? Documentation of all your requirements leads to gathering your data and information from all of your sources, right? So once you know what your requirements are, you're performing the research. If you've developed a large, extensive organization where you've got analysts and collectors, the collection team is taking the requirements and, and uh, uh, using those from those analysts to go off and find the stuff that you want them to look for. Uh, now those collections teams can be human intelligence, they can be uh, signals intelligence experts, data scientists, whatever. These are folks that are going to be able to take the majority of this information and go, based upon the requirements that have developed, that you've developed as a, as an analyst, go get you the stuff that you need. Ultimately, it goes into a normalization structure. This is where you bring everything together. It starts to make some logical sense. You process this inbound information. And by processing this inbound information, you're going to be able to use this to produce your intelligence, right? This is where analytic tradecraft comes into play because you're taking the hypothesis that you originally generated with your planning and your requirements development, ultimately turning it into a piece of production. And at that point, this is where things cycle. In, uh, in the government space, something like 
between research and production, this can take months. In commercial intelligence organizations, this takes hours, days, right? Ultimately, this production process is where we've gone back, validated our hypothesis to determine whether or not this is actually correct. And if it is correct, producing the report, getting it peer reviewed, typically by individuals that are both within our area of expertise. If we've gotten to the point organizationally where we're able to specialize right into cyber criminal organizations, hacktivist organizations, I'm a Russian language specialist, I'm a Chinese language specialist, whatever. Because oftentimes if I'm a Russian language specialist, when I look at it, when I look at what's happening inside an environment, I'm going to call it Russia because that's who my boogeyman is. Um, so I need to get it looked at by other people to make sure that I'm not my, op my uh, that I'm not biased, right? That I'm not applying my own cognitive biases to my report generation. So this production cycle should take a few, uh, couple hours, couple days, couple people, right? Different areas that are going to review the, review your final production and then ultimately disseminate it, right? So that dissemination process is everything that you've built, right? Shoving the IOCs into the tip, which ultimately go to the CDC, generating the new report that goes to the executives in the line of business that are, pardon me, that are associated with this, and then getting feedback. Every report should have a feedback button on it, because if it doesn't, then again, you're wasting their time. If they can't tell you that this didn't help them, then they're never going to you're never going to find out that it didn't help them and they're not going to look at it the next time. We are trying to put things in front of them to make their lives easier and if it, and we need to get their feedback to make sure that we're making their lives easier. Pardon me while I take a drink of beer. Ah. Mm. Yeah. Um but one of the biggest things here is quantitative data is important, but you also end up having to put human judgment on it, right? Uh, data scientists be damned, I still need my gut to make sure that I look at something and it's right. I Don't get me wrong, I love data scientists because they make such cool things that allow me to identify outliers, but I still need to be able to judge the intent of something. And we haven't gotten to the point where I, where I feel that it, that has uh, sentiment and judgment analysis has gotten great in uh, in sort of the machine learning and AI models yet. It's getting there, but it's not there yet. Five years from now, I'll probably be like, screw it all, we're done. Uh, AI can do everything, but right now it's not. At the end of the day, I like to say a good Intel program is like good books or like good journalism, because ultimately it tells a story. Every good report should tell a story. It should tell you what is happening, where it's happening, when did it or will it happen? How did it happen? And why the fuck are they doing it? Right? It's actually those same sort of like journalistic questions that we all learned in like fourth grade when we learned how to write a, uh, uh, an essay, right? Answer the who, what, where, when, why, and how. Ultimately, that's really what we're still doing, right? We're generating a narrative that is easily consumed and it tells the story about why is APT uh, 3 coming at us next week using China Chopper and uh, in order to get at our, uh, our intellectual property uh, because we make uh, super giant tractors? It's a completely random example I just made up. Um, but ultimately, these are just like good books. So. This is a problem that I have, right? It, it's a library. It's a lot of books. It's a lot of reports. I've been trying to find the right tool. And a lot of the threat intelligence platforms are really good at sort of storing things in XML format or in JSON. And, and I think of this as books, right? So I've been trying to mess with different tools that allow me to, to create content that matches my needs. Right. So, how many of you have a giant library of MP3s and or um, movies, videos? Yeah, I'm not gonna. You're not gonna. Uh, right. You have a Plex server. You have, um, in my case, a Media Monkey library for all my uh, for all my music. Uh, Calibre for all my uh, for all my books. But what do these do? These are all about like taking different media, different content, 
and putting it into a way that I can find it. Right? So it's about taking the content that we've generated, putting it into a way that makes sense to me. It makes it so that all my books are available to me as a reader. It makes it so, you know, every reader has access to the appropriate books so somebody can just crack open the media monkey that's associated with my, with my appropriately tagged, uh, MP3s and be able to identify. I'm looking for all of the 1997, uh, uh, hardcore Bay Area punk. Boom, it pops up. There it is, right? Um, this turns into what I like to think of as an autobiographical definition of our library. Yes, he was right when he categorized all his records autobiographically in Gross Boy Blank. Ultimately, I think that's what we have to do from an intelligence perspective. So we think about ourselves as an organization. We think about what, are, what we're being targeted with and how we're being targeted. We need to build this library in a way that makes sense. And the only way it's going to make sense to the lines of business, to the organization itself, is if we build it around ourselves autobiographically. We know who we are and what we're being targeted with and why we're being targeted. We build the appropriate tagging mechanisms that match the language that we use internally. That means that there is no specific set way that you're going to ta use different language than what you're going to use when you build your library. Because to you, infrastructure may be, they may use CPE for every piece of infra because they've actually got it. And for you, they may use like the common canonical name. Very different, right? So understanding from an autobiographical perspective, what is the linguistics that we use? What is the lingua franca, if you will, of us organizationally? And who are we ultimately? Building the reports in a way that makes sense to us so that always when somebody goes to our internal site to see what the newest threat intel is, the things that are most important to them pop up first. Which means we need a custodian. And I know that sounds really bad because you want to make sure that everybody has access to this information, but ultimately in order to make sure that it makes sense, we need somebody who's building the requirements of the data sources themselves whose role is to update these repositories. It really is the job of a librarian. Library science has been around for a long ass time, a lot longer than we've been in InfoSec, a lot longer than we've been in, in you know, technology, you know, pretty much generally, right? I, well, we can get into a very specific debate about what technology is associated with librarianship, blah, 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 blah. But Technology, as we, as we think about it, post IBM, uh, you know, giant computers when we, when the term bug still meant moths, right? Librarianship has been around for a much longer period of time. And because it's all around custodian, uh, being a custodian and curating information for our users. And so we need to find somebody who can do this for us, cataloging and tag tagging all the assets, making certain that we've developed a, a strong methodology around this. That's where librarians actually come into play. So thinking about it this, from this perspective, folks that have come out of journalism school typically don't have jobs. I mean, I hate to say it, but uh, every citizen with a webcam and a iPhone is a journalist now. Um, so journalists need jobs. They're really good at writing. They're really good at answering those questions. And to be quite frank, there's a lot of institutions that have really good J schools that could easily transition to Intel schools. Um, there's a lot of small Intel schools on the East Coast. And I would be willing to bet if you came out of a J school, uh, journalism school, you could probably write Intel, uh, Intel reports as good as those folks that come out with specific degrees in intelligence analysis. Uh, librarians as custodians. That's also important. I think we should start sealing them as well. And then weather forecasters, just not just because they're really good at, you know, grabbing the, the, uh, sort of, uh, weather data, uh, but ultimately because they're really good at processing large quantities of complex information and making predictive analysis with area, with, uh, with confidence scoring, right? If we don't have good weather mapping, then planes go down, ships sink, marines don't get on beaches, whatever you want to call it, right? So a lot of investment in weather forecasting and data science is really 
uh, uh, data science and weather forecasting actually are hand in hand. And the ability to be able to pull those things together, I think, is something we can steal into the Intel organization as well. So as we look at it holistically, we build out these are the types of people we should probably be looking for as we move from just me as an Intel analyst for a company to building out a threat intelligence operation for my organization. If you build the ops with the team building in mind, if you can get three headcount, you're way ahead of the game. Get an analyst, a librarian, and a technologist. That technologist is solely responsible for building out the technology that underlies your platforms. Ultimately then, that analyst or the librarian, whoever is more personable, gets to be the person that goes and talks to the executives, the line of business, the IT, physical security, all that shit. Because that is the person who's actually going to be able to extract the requirements from those individuals. Put the technical person on vendor analysis because ultimately that's really a great spot for them. Being able to identify the various technologies, determine which repositories are good, what content is good, and then play that back to the, to the LOBs uh, as well. So you turn that into a a really good cycle. And again, continuous engagement, builds your budget, builds your business case, and makes certain that everybody looks, uh, that it looks like that money that they're giving you to spend is actually being spent wisely. The technologist then is typically in, uh, engaged in the integration and processing strategy. Ultimately, this is where your analyst is performing the enrichment or decoration, whatever you want to call it. They're taking your own uh, intelligence, fusing it with the external vendor data source, and then generating this, the, these first sets of Intel, right? And that's typically, if you've been brought in as the Intel analyst to run this, that's your role, right? You build in your context associated with the third-party data that you've gathered. Now, whether you're using any outside vendor or OSINT or whatever, doesn't matter. It's application of your own context and contextual awareness that have come out of these requirements building into the enrichment, which generate the reports, which then you disseminate and again come back to the feedback loop. Because this has got to be cyclical. Where do we keep fucking this up? We all want this operational short-term focus and indicator-driven. Every time we we get engaged in this, we're typically, these are the first two things. I got I got a million false positives on my Splunk because of this, or I didn't see any hits. I'm looking at it just in that space. Typically, those types of requirements ultimately are going to mean that you're, uh, from a budget perspective, you've got like two years before they're like, well, just go do something else. Um, the budgetary entanglements also happen because oftentimes this organization doesn't fit quite under the Cyber Defense Center, but doesn't fit quite under vulnerability and doesn't really fit under audit. You got to kind of navigate your way budgetarily. So if you're part of a threat intel operation organizationally, you've got to find a way to get your own budget. And if you don't have your own budget, to make certain that you've got a nice piece carved out of whoever's budget you're sharing, because the first couple bits can get costly. And it doesn't look like you're going to be immediately returning ROI. Another thing that typically happens is, yeah, focus on uh, the action ability, not the information quality. People just want that thing to, to like light up right away, and it, it's not always going to do that. So I'm going to complain about something, actionable intelligence. I fucking hate that term. Um, because actionable intelligence, what does that really mean? Actionable intelligence doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that I can immediately... Uh, you know, take take action on. Well, if I'm immediately taking action on it, wouldn't it have been great if I'd had an informational intelligence report about it two weeks ago, which meant that I wouldn't need to be immediately taking action on it right now? I just think about the idea that actionable intelligence tends to be indicator-focused, machine-formatted. It's really, again, of the moment, whereas informational intelligence is requirement-driven. It's research uh, it's research touts. It's the books in your library. It's typically written at analytical standards. It's designed for humans. Oftentimes, it's complicated to parse. But if you've done the requirements build, you've delivered, you, you know what your research purposes are, you've created both structured and unstructured content within your, within your intelligence reporting, informational intelligence is incredibly useful, and you're able to gain actionable capabilities outside of the informational intelligence. So we're almost done. I think I've got one more thing. Uh, uh, typical approach for building out uh, a program starts with 
uh, establishing and updating your foundations, building the assessment, the capability and training your resources. Ultimately, this is a cycle because, again, we've got to be able to do this continuously. I know I'm almost done. Um, where does all this stuff come from? Uh, you know, obviously, you've got to be able to do your in-house collection, your security products, your information systems, all the business plans that you've got. Have you ever read your organization's uh, 10K? You should, because ultimately that's going to identify what is actually important to the fucking business. And if you know what's important to the business, you know what you're protecting. When you look at the vendor side of it, you've got to find vendors that have good talent, that have good access, and ultimately that, that give their analysts time. So if you're at third-party vendor evaluations, these are the questions you should be asking the vendors. But your in-house collection processes, you know, ISACs are a good place to get, to get raw content. Uh, OSINT sources, again, all of that fits into building your, uh, into building your library, your Intel library. Ultimately, that's, that's about it. So, I, uh, five minutes before I go, there's my Twitter, there's me. Um, yeah, we'll leave that at that. Um, questions? Yes? Have you come across anybody you are, in your experience, uh, has a good recommendation how to uh, stress the importance of requirements to non-Intel people? So I haven't found any writing on it as of yet. That doesn't mean that it's not out there. Um, I, what I find is anecdotes actually work pretty well in these cases. And I hate to, to, to put it, to, to put it on the, on sort of that anecdotal terms. But to be quite honest, uh, that's usually being able to say, hey, you wouldn't want me over here studying the Chinese threat when to be, when everything that we're producing is actually being, you know, mass produced in Estonia as well. I should be spending all, wasting all of my time and money looking at that when I should be looking over here. It's finding those different things. Um, I like to take use cases that come out of like, um, some of the vendor reports, right? So recorded future, uh, FireEye, EyeSight, um, uh, even Symantec has some decent Intel reports, being able to pull those out and use those to be able to build out that this is why we looked over here instead of over here, and that's how we were able to prevent this from happening. I think those are actually good anecdotes, but I haven't found a book yet. Maybe I should write one. I don't know. Um, that, but that needs to be done, ultimately. There needs to be something that's done about that. I think that falls under business intelligence when we say business intelligence. They're like, Buh! yep. It makes a lot more sense. And getting that out of the LOVs actually works really well at that point, right? If you talk to them about their, talking to them about their business, now we, I was deflecting it back to the security side, but yeah, from the business requirements, yeah, def talking to them about their business. That's why I like the story of how I first started, you know, found out how many softies we had, right? It's like, I just started hanging out in the cafeteria with all these people that I never saw before. And I found out that they were all writing stuff on Qunix and they were a bunch of software engineers. And then I, they let me have access to the systems. And I realized that they were putting elevators on, on, uh, computer networks. And I was like, y'all are stupid. And they stopped doing it. Um, <laughs> but needless to say, uh, the, those, understanding the business requirements and why they're making the, the choices they make is actually, is very important. I'm sorry? Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Thanks for answering the questions in the middle of that. Sure, yeah, I, I like communication.